quick enough answer to come to it from the next great answer we looked at today. So I do need to say a few things, so just bear with me. Um, most obviously, um, I think I'd like to just um, uh, say a little bit about why we were made for this event, as it were, um, in honor of, of a colleague who, who, who died um, uh, recently, um, um, Professor Tony Sievers. Um, I have the pleasure of working with him for nearly 10 years on the Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies. Um, and in that time, um, he was one of, you know, certainly was one of the best reviewers and gave me uh, a great deal of really important advice. Um, and there are, um, you, you know, uh, too few people uh, of that calibre in the world who, who specialise in disability studies. Um, so when we have those, uh, people, you know, um, it, it's they become very popular uh, in, uh, among colleagues, as it were. But obviously, it's a little bit sensitive talking about this, so I'll try to move forward as, as quickly as I can. But I would like to say um, that in that time, um, quite early on, in in, in knowing um, uh, Professor Sievers, um, I was um, this was before I was in post here. When, when the idea of the centre and so on was just the kind of idea that floated above the journal. Um, and so if ever I was in, involved in organising something like this, um, it would not be um, <laughs> any set place as it were, so it would be perhaps the MMU or uh, Lancaster or Leeds. And it was one of these uh, kind of arrangements that we were circling around, and it would have involved um, Tobin coming to the UK and, and, and giving a presentation, uh, which was quite exciting. Uh, and then I did get a message from him um, just as we were coming up to kind of finalising that. And he just um, put in an email that I've uh, got cancer um, and it's going to be um, uh, delayed at least uh, worse to that effect. So, you know, a difficult message uh, to receive, let alone to send, as it were. Um, but as time went on, I mean, I maintained contact with him, but um, perhaps um, uh, wrongly, I didn't really inquire about that, as it were, uh, about his health. Um, and I just found that, that he carried on working, and, and, you know, again, I put myself uh, the, at fault here, but I kind of started to assume that he was, quote, okay. That things had kind of worked out. And I do realise that the language I'm using is um, uh, problematic here, but this is the best I've got. Um, and um, I was kind of starting to think that, as I say, things had kind of worked worked out. Um, and and I, 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 that wasn't the case. I mean, as, as time went on, I was getting more and more uh, work from him. He was doing more and more for the journal, and he actually went on um, to co-guest edit co editor specialist. You know, I did get one email that said um, he was going to be delayed in, in some of the work that he was going to be doing uh, henceforth, as it were. He, you know, he did tell me he was going to be delayed. And, and that was the nearest I got to being told uh, just how unwell he was um, in, in the later years, as it were. Um, so it, it was a, a bit of a shock all the same, you know, um, uh, in that context, even though you know, years before I, I had a, that original message. Um, but, I, I mean, I'm hoping you can kind of understand where I'm telling that part of the story. You know that this is someone who was very productive in the field uh, right up until, uh, up until he died. Um, and, and so I think, um, you know, such an important um, person um, uh, does deserve, um, some, you know, that, that to be marked, as it were. And I think it's nice to mark it somewhere, you know, across the world from where he was based, as it were. Um, and I should say that when I had the kind of idea of, of holding this event, um, Petra was the first person I thought of to, to ask to do the lecture because of the sort of subject, um, and also because of, uh, she, she comes from the same um, uh, institution as, uh, as Toby. Um, and so I, I approached uh, um, Petra initially, and then I also approached um, Mrs. Sievers to ask if we could have, this, uh, could have her blessing. And, um, and she did give that blessing, as it were, in a few days, uh, which was really nice and much appreciated. 
Um, so, you know, that's, that, that's why we're holding this event, as it were. Um, and I want to then perhaps turn now to say a, a few more thank yous before we move to talk about Petra more specifically. Um, these kind of events um, are, are always involve a lot of people. Um, and, you know, everything I do, I must thank my partner, Heidi, who um, kind of puts up with me 24-7. Uh, my support work at Pepper, who puts up with me well, 24 hours a week, and that seems to be enough. Um, you know, and, and also everyone in the Department of Disability and Education. You know that these are people who are always uh, working in, in this area, as it were. Um, there are people who don't always get recognised, and I think it would be nice to show them recognition here because, um, as Petra might mention, um, you know, we did have some uh, complications when in, in organising this event, um, largely to do with the airline, um, which, which meant that Petra was, didn't meet the first um, kind of uh, plane where, where, where she should have done that, you know, because uh, it wasn't there. Um, so one thing led to another, and uh, this time yesterday, um, we, it didn't look hopeful, let's just say that. Uh, but let's say that we'll talk about. So I'm just wondering, is, is Michelle here? The events for the last, CCDS events for the last few years, and uh, I know she does loads of work that isn't always recognised, but uh, let's just say she's very popular among, among anyone who walked behind the So uh, thanks so much, uh, Michelle. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, and I know uh, Petra has already started to show appreciation there. Um, okay, so then, then we'll move um, over um, to talk about Petra a little bit. Um, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Petra about 10 years ago, actually, mm -hmm. uh, when it was a, um, the, the kind of idea of cultural disability studies in the UK was very different then. I actually travelled up, up the uh, country uh, to, to meet Petra just to spend a few hours with her because it was someone who was doing cultural disability studies in the UK. Someone was present, you know, so we, we actually met just to sit outside of pub and talk for a few hours. It was lovely. Um, it was lovely. Um, but thank you. In the countryside. Yeah. It was gorgeous at that church. Yeah, That's absolutely. Lovely church, um, graveyard. But I mean, thankfully, now we do have a whole lot more people in the UK working in this, in this area. Um, and certainly Petra has done a, a share in, in, in making that happen. Um, I can say something which is quite nice for me to be able to say is that Petra was the first person to submit something to JRCDS. Hey, so the very first um, submission I got, and I read that and thought, hey, you know what? This is good. Because <laughs> 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 at the time it was, how will we have a journal that's like full with material? Now it's how, you know, I'm, I'm booked up till 18 and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> it's how to kind of fit it all in, but then it was, could we really get that many uh, articles? You know, two issues per year. Needless to say, we just about stop four issues per year. So it's nice to have things are progressing. And it was great for that first submission, uh, Petra. You know, <laughs> I, I can remember reading it and then walking around the block and thinking, and I've got to edit that. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> so I put my name on the side of it and moved on. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's uh, much appreciated, and, and it's only fair to say that over, over the years, Petra has done a great deal of work. I mean, but you've all been given, actually, a copy of, a, of an issue that, that Petra um, guest edited, uh, which was a fantastic issue. Again, me as editor-in-chief in that particular instance, I was lost on that material. That material was so rich, um, and it really was an education uh, for me to just be involved in that. Um, and, and so, again, much appreciated, Petra. Uh, Petra was very supportive in the first issue, actually, even though uh, she wasn't guest editing that. Uh, she would, I can remember sharing many um, uh, conversations about, about various... Um, that work poetry work. issue. Yeah. yeah. That was absolutely. lovely, yeah. It's a yeah. good issue. And so of interesting had, people. Yeah, and I had a... Um, as well as published in one of your articles in there, Petra, you mm -hmm. did um, um, co-author one as well. Uh, with Stephen Cusisto, which again was, was a really interesting um, part of the, of the process, as it were. Um, and since then, you know, you've done book reviews, other articles, and the, the rate of reviews as well, I, I honestly can't remember you ever declining a, a single uh, submission that I sent to, to, to review. So again, much appreciated. Always timely, 
it makes the job a pleasure. <laughs> um, and I'll just say it in that capacity, actually, um, we do have um, a system where, where the, the reviewers are uh, recognised. Now, in my position, that is very tricky when I've got uh, a board of approaching 60 people and they're all right at the top of uh, the, the field. You know, these are brilliant reviewers. It's not very often, you, you, you know, I've got any complaints there. Um, and Petra, I can tell you that your name has been put forward this year as the, the top reviewer for, for the journal. Uh -huh. So you will, you'll get your certificate from LUP. Oh, thank they you were so much. To present you today. Oh, it's a uh, love fest here, isn't it? It's <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, so that, that's fantastic. Um, okay, well, I think that the best thing I can do then is really um, let uh, Petra um, speak. And, um, you know, because I know she wants to meet you all, as it were, and we'll do it that way. So, uh, perhaps you can show your appreciation then for Professor Petra Corpus. Thank you. Thank you for the really lovely introduction and memory of Toby as well. Yeah, thank you. That was great. And um, I placed myself here rather than at the podium because I'd be sitting down anyway. And this way I can actually see your faces, which I personally enjoy. So thank you. I'm so glad to be here. If it looks halfway through that I don't know what I'm doing, it's probably because I've been traveling for 36 hours. <laughs> but um, it was quite a fascinating journey, uh, and it has all to do with global warming it's in many interesting ways. It was so hot in Denver that the airplane couldn't take off, and we had to take all our luggage out of the airplane. So we were five hours delayed, and the luggage still hasn't arrived. The luggage is at this point somewhere in Iceland. Interesting. <laughs> But the whole thing meant that I was able to get out of the airport in Iceland and I got to smell the lupins of Iceland and it was magical. So it was quite interesting. But unfortunately I only arrived here three hours ago so <laughs> I didn't quite have enough sleep. And I'm also wearing my, uh, my pink nighty basically. You know, just, I'm trying desperately to cover up but um, yeah, that's just how it goes. Um, so this, this is not clearly my style, pink nighty style. <laughs> ah, so, um, but it sets an interesting framework for the talk, you know, sustainability, global warming, how do we in disability studies begin to address the deeper underlying issues that, that, that subtend all our lives. I arrived here, I got a, a taxi ride from Manchester Airport here and the taxi driver was talking about global warming. He was talking about it in the context of it raining here all the time right now, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. right? Um, so for me about Denver being 100 degrees, i.e. 40-something degrees Celsius. Um, and then the other thing, of course, he talked about was Brexit, and he talked about asylum seekers, he talked about, you know, all the, you know, it was, it was, it was just like what I've been reading in all the newspapers. It was just like that. I mean, he was literally out of his mouth came all the anti-asylum seeker stuff that, um, that I have been reading about, and I've been careful not to like, reproduce that as, as a voice anywhere, because I also read accounts and say, no, that's not how everybody writes, speaks about it, but he did, like full on, full on. And it was really hard to listen to, and I'm sorry. And uh, my, own, my own personal biography relates very clearly to, to what's going on in, around Brexit. I'm German. I was one of the, uh, the lucky recipients of a beautiful British education. I did my PhD here at Falmouth College of Arts. I was uh, one of the first people to do the certi Certificate for Health and Social Welfare Studies with the Open University, i.e. the first kind of disability studies certificates that we had here in the UK. And uh, it's just really sad for me to hear, to see and to hear what's, what's going on, so I'm sorry. I know it impacts all of us in terms of international disability culture as well. There's such a traffic between us. Um, I know it's just wonderful to sit here right next to Ruth. It's lovely to see you here. <laughs> Dame Ruth. I call you Dame Ruth. I just have to call you Dame Ruth now. Because <laughs> um, I remember very fondly, I don't know, it was probably more than 10 years ago. Yeah, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, when we were in Lippa together and we're working on that show. We had a beautiful show. And before that, I remember teaching on the training the trainers course with Mickey Fellows. Anybody here remembers Mickey Fellows from Liverpool? 
Ruth, you remember me. So there you go. Yeah, <laughs> training the trainers, you know, the old, the preparation for when there was, um, uh, uh, what was it called? Um, you know, that, that the scheme that allowed many disabled people like myself to be employed by going to companies that had over 50 people and they all had to do disability training. Right, remember that one? Disability equality, equality training. And in order to, to give disability equality training, we had to go through a training. It was one of the, the grounds for disability art, art activism in this country. And Mickey was the leader of one of those um, training the trainers courses. And he had brought me in, and I was doing it at Lancaster too, helping people to think about how to use art activism for political work, which is exactly what I'm talking about today. So I'm coming full round to Liverpool, which is great. Okay, let me just check some technical stuff. So first of all, can everybody hear me okay with this? Yeah. Okay. Those of you who need access copies, we send them out electronically rather than print them out. Does everybody who needs an, act an, an access copy have one? Those of you who registered. <laughs> okay, um, all right, so it looks like you got it. If at any point I go too slow or too fast or um, my accent is getting weird, you know, <laughs> German, Michigan, 10 years in Wales, a year in New Zealand, it's a strange accent. People always try to figure out where I'm from. And I'm actually not from South Africa, but I know I sound like that. Um, so uh, if, if I ever, like, if you, if you lose it, just, just please raise your hand. I'm really cool with just slowing down or repeating or something. Just, just give me a sign that I can see or hear, and that will allow me to then check in with you guys. Um, I will try not to go too far off script so that those of us who do use the access copy can follow along. Uh, some, yeah, and so before I get going though, I would love to have more of a sense of who's in the room, because for me this is such a great occasion to meet my British um, <coughs> fellow travelers in disability culture, disability arts and culture, disability studies. So if it's okay with you guys, <laughs> I just shave a little bit of my, my talk time and just I just want to hear who's here. If we could just go around and if you could loudly, if you can, speak, tell us who you are and you know may, maybe uh, one sentence about what you're working on. We don't want to take the whole time up because I know you want to hear this paper and I'm glad to deliver it, but I really want to know who's here. Does that work? Ruth, Dame Ruth, can you start us up? <laughs> um, hi everyone, I'm the Artistic Director at Galifest which formerly was Northwest Disability Arts Forum, where um, Petra met Mickey, who's working for that organisation, mm -hmm. which has been in Liverpool since 1984. And this is a festival year. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Thank you. 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 Disability and science fiction. Thank you. I'm Ria Chi. Oh, this is great. We have a microphone. It's so much better. I'm Ria Chin, and I'm a lecturer in disability and education yes. here at Liverpool Hope. Lovely. Thank you. Um, and I also want to say, by the way, if people want to hook up, I'm here for three more days, so particularly if you're local, and I have absolutely no program apart from some stuff in the evenings, I'd love to have cups of coffee. I'm Marie Kasling. I'm a lecturer in disability and education at Liverpool Hope University. Lovely. Thank you. Hi, I'm Heidi Matthew, and I'm a disability citizen in Sweden. Yeah, just behind you, some other tables. Um, I'm Susie Angus, I'm also in the Disability Studies MA, mm -hmm. I'm working on my dissertation. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Laura Swinbank, um, I'm from the Heart of Glass, an arts organisation in St Helens, a um, collaborative organisation, um, I'm working on my disability programme at the moment. You're doing disability programming at the organisation? Yeah, yeah I'm fundraising at the moment, so I'm um, writing all the Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for doing all the infrastructural labour. <laughs> Hello, I'm Anna Murray. I'm assistant curator at Tate. I'm based in London, so that's Tate London too. Lovely. Thank you. I am Laura Wright. I'm a lecturer in disability and education here at Liverpool. Mm -hmm. I'm Denise Saw. I'm a PhD student and founder of a collaborative arts project with people with um, speech disorders. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pauline Eyre. I'm uh, an independent researcher. I think that's what you call me. Um, I work on uh, uh, disability in German and French uh, literature as well. Um, Lovely, thank you. Like my dear colleague Claire Poole, mm. right? Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm with Cromwell Gas and Sport Radio. Thank you. I'm Kelly and I'm from Cromwell Gas. I'm Daniela and I'm from Cromwell Gas and I'm in marketing. I'm Kelly and I'm also from Cromwell Gas. Lovely. This. And Caroline and Janice Peeve. Mm -hmm. I'm Catherine Nichols. I teach creative writing at Leeds University. Um, I'm published as a poet, but I'm really interested in children's literature as well. Okay, thank you. I'm Mike Layward. I'm artistic director at DASH. We're a specialist disability visual arts organisation in Shropshire. Mm -hmm. We we'll work across England, Wales, and beyond. Hi, my name is Robert Lando. Uh, I'm a musician. I just finished doing my master's in youth and community studies, but I have very special interest in disability studies and arts. Lovely, thank you. Uh, I'm Alan Hopkins, and I work here in the uh, Department of uh, Disability and Education. Mm -hmm. I'm Pauline Rowe. I work as poet in residence for Good Mental Health Trust, and I'm doing a PhD um, at Liverpool University. Focusing on representations of madness and poetry. Cool. Thank you. Interesting. I'm Ella Houston. I do BEA and MA in disability studies here at Liverpool House, and I would happily do it again. Um, <laughs> I'm now doing a PhD at Lancaster, uh, looking at representation of deaf gender and disability in advertising. Uh, I teach in the Department of Disability and Education here as well. Lovely. <coughs> Hi, I'm Yana, Gemma's PA. Uh, Gemma is a freelance artist and is an advocate for Drake music. Lovely, thank you. Hi, Gemma. Hi, uh, my name is Jade, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Leeds. And I'm working with the Blue Coats, which is an art gallery in Liverpool City Centre, and we're working looking around inclusive curation for people with learning disabilities. Hi, I'm Eileen Rose and I work in Disability Studies and Education in Essex. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm David Feeling and I'm a lecturer here in Disability and Education. Lovely. Hello, I'm Bob and I'm also a lecturer in Disability and Education in Europe. Hi, I'm Claire Pegasus, I'm Head of Department for Disability and Education at Hope. And my research is in um, Art Education and Disability. Lovely, thank you. Well, it's really nice to meet you all. It's great to see the room so full, because I remember it like you did 10 years ago, and it would be really, really hard to get a room as full as this. So thank you for doing all your work here, and thank you for getting everybody together like this. It's uh, an extraordinary achievement that you've, uh, something that you've you created here. And I remember 10 years ago, how many of us were talking about the fact that there was this new disability, um, cultural literary disability studies journal emerging in Britain and how exciting it was for so many of us to be involved and to be on the board. So thank you. I continue the love fest this way. <laughs> <laughs> so great. All right. So let me talk about, give my talk. And I'm, I'm just so honored to do it in honor of Toby as well. So um, I arrived at the University of Michigan 10 years ago. Uh, Toby had, had been at the university for quite a long time. Uh, had started um, the disability studies work. Um, he, he wasn't the founder of the University of Michigan Initiative on Disability Studies because as it should be, it was founded by staff and students. You know, that's always really important. That where, where, the, where the different places that our stuff starts from? And as so often, it came out of an activist impulse rather than an academic one. And so he was very, very clear and quick in pointing this out. So our organization, the University of Michigan Initiative on Disability Studies, emerged out of staff and student energies. And he was the longest running director of the program. 
when I joined the program at the University of Michigan, I became his co-director. Like when and when he became, when he fell ill, um, myself, Christine Mulhorn, and Anna Kirkland were three women who shifted the the co-directorship between ourselves. Um, and then Toby very sadly passed away. Um, he passed away just at just before the last big disability arts and culture symposium. I had been organizing every year a, a sort of a symposium where people came together not to give talks at one another, but to play with one another. We got into a room together and we created work together, very much in the spirit of Ruth, what, what, you, what you and I know as disability arts and culture work. So instead of delivering information to each other, we ran workshops with one another. And so in 2014, 2015, in February, um, the last day of our symposium was the day that we all went to Toby's memorial. So it's very moving to be here with you and to remember that. And I'm kind of affected right now with that. Um, yes. This talk, though, will be about the asylum project, since it seems so appropriate to what it is that's going on right now in, in the wider world, both in, in the US. I'm sure you have been following the terrible race work that's going on there right now. You know, the, the, the effects of racialization are coming home to roost in ways that are terrible to witness and that really, really dangerous for so many people. Um, that's one story. The other story, of course, is here, what's going on here right now in this country. Um, so the Asylum Project is an international disability culture workshop series that began a year ago um, when Anna uh, Hickey Moody uh, from, uh, the, from London University had invited my partner and me to come and do a disability arts uh, project at the university. And she gave us the title of the Asylum and we created the series. And those of you who are on the reading li on the, the, the invitation list got a copy of a Theatre Topics article that speaks about this work. And it speaks about us visiting at Bedlam, the Royal Bethlehem Hospital, and the New Museum of the Mind. So in this field report, I'm tracing the development of the project as it shifts form in different spaces. Um, so you've, you have the theatre topics one, and if you don't have it and you want to have it, just tell us and you'll get it. Um, creating these collaborative traces of disability culture research is one of my core interests. Uh, so those of you who are familiar with my work, you might have read before material that's, that's not just authored by me. You know, there's always a multiple authorship going on. Sometimes I'm the reporter, I'm a, of, I'm, I'm a form of anthropological reporter on what's going on, but oftentimes we literally speak with multiple voices. We, we write in collages. So lots of different people have their voices in the, in the work. And it's, that's, that's a complicated thing to publish in contemporary academia. Those of you who are PhD students right now we can probably relate to that. But some of the more experimental forms of writing out there might not necessarily gain recognition within the contemporary academic field. So it's something to think about, something we can talk about afterwards. But it's something that's very core to my personal research aesthetic. Uh, this was also something that was of interest to Toby, and he strongly supported the kinds of disability culture adventures that I'm narrating today. And he offered me my first major University of Michigan grant in 2007 when I was working on the Anaka project. The Anaka project brought together disability culture activists, African American culture specialists, and bioethicists. In a deep engagement over multiple days, participants created a performance response to historical knowledge about experimentation on slave women and on contemporary race-based health inequalities. So this was a project that we ran for about two years, 2007 to 2009, uh, between African-American cultural specialists, disability cultural specialists, and bioethicists. And it's something that's still used quite a bit in medical education, when people look at the kind of racialized medical knowledge that's come down the pipeline to us? How do we deal with the racist heritage of some of the work that's still going on? Um, you know, or some of the, the base, the racist heritage of some of the work that is informing contemporary medicine. So we were looking at performance as a way of investigating 
uh, this work together. So instead of coming up with strong with answers or with policy recommendations, we instead explore what it meant to do this work together. Again, if you want to find out more about that, I wrote about this intensely. Um, so did many of my collaborators. Um, speak to me afterwards if you need some references for this. Um, I don't know whether this has gone out in the, U in the UK much. Tobin funded this work with a year-long Global Ethnic Literatures Grant. I'm pointing all these infrastructural things out. You will find out in a minute as my talk, as I get going, that infrastructures are important. You know, how we think about what sustains us, how we think about the things that fly us around the world, the things that allow us to cross boundaries and borders. In today's talk, I'll speak to another project, our current one, and to a particular facet of it that seems most urgent to me right now, this week, in the aftermath of the race and ethnic relations nose diving, exposing cracks that have been in place for a long time, both in the US and, of course, here in Britain as well. The asylum inquiry uses site visits and encounters to explore multiple meanings of asylum, from asylum seekers in the limits of the state to psychiatric asylums and queer sanctuary space, to temporary places of security and refuge. In this experimental community arts project, we use movement and writing to investigate how body minds inhabit, touch, and intersect asylum space. Our project draws on personal histories. My collaborator and partner, poet dancer Stephanie Heights' experience as a psychiatric system survivor, and my own experience with art practice as a mode of inquiry in disability culture. We are two disabled women placed in very different ways. I was able to move into the university after a career as a disabled community dance artist. Stephanie, who practices in somatic movement and writing modalities, cannot work in such sustained ways after nearly 20 mental health hospitalizations and traumatic brain injury from electroconvulsive therapy, electroshocks. We understand our joint leadership of our project as a political act, as an avowal of new ways of shaping leadership and structures for meaning of success. Together we bear witness to how knowledge creation can function otherwise in our shared social world. This way of working half in and half out of academia, activism and art worlds responds to the core calls of feminist disability studies, the kind of calls that have been issued by Rosemary Garland Thompson or Alison Kafer. We are working interdependently, focusing on connection. Feminist philosopher Eva Federkite writes about foregrounding collectivity, quote, but who in any complex society is not dependent on others for the production of our food, for our mobility, for a multitude of tasks that make it possible for each of us to function in our work and daily living, end of quote. Dependency and interdependency is at the heart of the sanctuaries we explore, leaning into walls, leaning onto one another, sharing weight. We inform our asylum project investigation with material like I Little, As <coughs> I Little Asylum by Emmanuel Guattari. Has anybody read that? I Little Asylum, did it get any play here? No one heard about that one before? Interesting. So this is um, a really interesting little text just came out. And Emmanuel Guattari is the daughter of Felix Guattari, of Deleuze and Guattari, i.e. the text. So you, you got lying in front of you there, the special issue on Deleuze mm -hmm. and disability that, um, that we edited for, for the journal. Uh, so I, I kind of love that stuff, you know. <laughs> and, and it's really interesting to see, to see it come around in a different way. So Guattari was an experimental psychoanalyst working out of Le Bourde in France. Has anybody heard about that one? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an experimental psychiatric asylum where, um, where, where people live together. There's, it was an experiment in, in exploring hierarchies in, in anti-psychiatry. Psychiatry dash anti-psychiatry, that kind of interesting experimental border space. So Emmanuel, the daughter of Guattari, grew up. She spent her, she, in this book she poetically chroni chronicles her childhood growing up in this psychiatric asylum, the board. And she pays attention to the sites, networks, and infrastructures that support communities, the collective enactment of support. This was not a community where the, the staff and the patients lived separate from one another. There was 
an interpenetration, a working together and a living together, and an interest in the kind of poetics that emerged out of conceptions of madness. Her book takes us on drives with, an in, with the inmate who chauffeurs the taxi. Uh, her book visits the kitchen, and in one very memorable episode, the asylum's children end up in the latrine. <coughs> this focus on the human and non-human and often disavowed networks of interdependence subtends our project's approach to the asylum project without going into the latrine, hopefully, but you know, I've been to all kinds of weird places. <laughs> what do we need to live together? What do we need in order to come to expression? Who is in the room with us? Who is not? And why? This is a question that is also central to our University of Michigan Disability Studies classroom. Who is in the room and who is not? So let's just engage with this ourselves. Um, this is a, an activity that I do in most any disability studies classroom. Who's in the room and who's not in the room? Who would have been in the room at this, that, and that? historical moment. <coughs> this is an exercise that's really different in different nations. You know, it was interesting to, do, to run this in Australia, to run this in New Zealand. Let's run it here. And I don't know the answer to everything, <laughs> strangely enough. I do, I do not know all the cutoff dates in the UK. <laughs> I, I don't know them any place else either, actually. But, but it's really interesting to think together about at which point would we have found ourselves in this room, OK? So let's think about this. It's the year 1600. This is a university in the year 1600. Who here in this room could have potentially been at a university in the year 1600? Rich men. Say again? Rich men. <laughs> Rich, well, is there anybody in the room who identifies as being here, who could have been here amongst us? But oh, you're right, yes. Let's see if anybody, you know, without being down on anybody, is anybody here who thinks they could have had a chance of being at a university in the year 1600? Nobody. Okay, 1700. And that says something interesting about how we all here on these tables identify. Right? You know, how do you identify in relation to this? Actually, there's an interesting example of cultural difference. Um, in my classroom, my classroom is near Detroit, right? Ann Arbor is Michigan, it's very near Detroit. It's, uh, it's got a strong Arab American framework, and I often have Arab students in the room. And um, particularly Arab students would have actually found themselves. You know, maybe, maybe some other people might not have, but the Ottoman Empire, for instance, would have had a very strong academic system going on at that time. And you might find this quite interesting, uh, David, um, blind Arab men, particularly, might have found themselves at a university. We, I have a PhD student right now who's investigating the, the site of blindness in, um, in the Ottoman Empire. And it, gave a really it created a very interesting discussion in this experiment about what, how differently disability, uh, what we would now call disability, was conceived of at a different time. Because there, the fact that a blind man could memorize and remember a very significant amount of material made that person the ideal university person. Isn't that interesting? That's, That's interesting. All right. <laughs> so you go. 1700. Okay, we're going to 1800. No one here. That's interesting, isn't it? Okay, let's move a little bit more further on. 1850. I have certain dates in my mind. Let's say 1880. This is what, what happens in 1880. I'm sure there must be some people who might have gone to university before 1880. No? Anybody here thinks that no? Okay. This is very interesting about how we identify, right? How, how everybody in this room identifies around each class, for instance. Because in many, normally at this point, some people would have gotten themselves into university, right? That's interesting. 1880, that's a very important date within the UK. Does anybody know what happens in 1880 in the UK? Women, for the first time. Women, yeah, for the first time. We no longer believe that women's brains will explode <laughs> as soon as they enter the university is the date that the first four women graduate from the University of London. So we have four women in 1880 finally going to university without having their brains explode on them. Okay, so who here would have thought about, would have beginning to think about going to university in 1880? 
I do wish you to impl implicate yourselves, please. <laughs> There must be someone here. You were, you were thinking about it at that point. 1880 is the first. You're just thinking, I could go. I could just do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody's considering on going in 1900? <laughs> yes, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, so slowly it's kind of opening out, right? It's now, it's now an idea. It's something that's in people's mind. The first pe women have done it. We could theoretically go, if we had the, the right kind of familial background in some way or the other, if there's some kind of money around so we can afford it, then at least more of us can now consider going. Okay, and now it maybe gets a bit more interesting. Let's see, 1950, when, when did Raymond Williams write his stuff? Help me out, and that's kind of a bit later, 68 or something. What's the foundation of the Open University? Early 70s, but it's kind of started before then. Yeah, when yeah. is the, um, the women, uh, sorry, the workers' education stuff? That started a bit earlier. So maybe uh, let's try this one. Let's see how red brick we might be here. It's, it's 1950, who is now considering, 1960s, 1960, who is now considering going to university? Thank you. We have some more people. Excellent. Okay, cool. Because at this point, we have the Workers' Education Act, which has really opened up to who can go to university. And then indeed in the 70s, we had the beginning of the Open University, one of the very first places that allows for, um, for education without, without a barrier, right? That you, didn't, you don't need to have any kind of uh, qualification in order to go to university to go and study with the Open University. You know? So anybody who's done an Open University degree? All right, interesting. Yeah, I, I got mine from Open University. It was great, right? And you had all these, and I, I was able to teach with them too, and it was very exciting. I had some students that had to look at their, their milking schedules in order to set up our tutorials, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and there were other disabled people in there too. People, we were yet not yet able to get into all the rooms of traditional built universities. The open university was for many of us a first place. Set. So it's now the 1970s, which gets significantly close to well, probably our own age is for some of us, right? So Yeah, I went to university in the 70s. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so and then was, is there any other cut of time that is important to you and who you are in um, terms of university? Because well, there's 1995, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Jane Campbell, who is now obviously in the heart of yours, mm -hmm. and they used to have a picture of her on the wall as an example, but that must, that must have been perhaps in the late 70s, I don't think. That was in the late 70s. The, the Education Act, the UK Disability Education Act, was only passed in 1995. It's really like, well, it was only about access, 90, it was 2002. Yeah. That was the updated version of it. The first mentioning of it in yeah. the UK is in 1995. Yeah. The one person getting into uni, obviously we had to wait several a decade or two later to get the rest of us, you know, into potentially right. into uni. Yes, so it's, yeah. it's the one of the latest, the latest yeah. bunches of us to be able to get into anything, yeah. right? Because it took a long time for that legislation yeah. to pass. Yeah. Um, so this this kind of story is a bit different when I run this in the, in the US, where that act was still, you know, 1990, it's not a heck of a lot earlier, but it had teeth earlier. That's the part that's important. The teeth part, you know, where you actually had to do something about it, that was a little bit earlier. So it has, it shifted the way that, that a contemporary higher education environment looks like. It shifted that a little bit earlier. Um, you had more access, physical access in particular, a little bit earlier. Okay, so this is, uh, this is an interesting activity to run here, you know, because normally there'd be a lot more, lot more hands up at different times, but that's okay. 
it's it's something interesting to think about. Maybe you can want to run this with your want to run this with your students. You know, how can they project themselves back? I've I've always had students identify quite early on with not really with being super rich, but with coming from a, a, some kind of solid middle class. So they were raising so men men who were raising their heads quite their, their hands quite quite early, which is which is great. You know, it's nice to identify it with themselves that way as well, that we do have very, very different access to education. Is there anybody who is not guaranteed access to education now? Who is not in the room with us? And why? Yeah, people with learning, dif yeah. learning dis difficulties, learning dis disabilities, yeah. intellectual differences whichever language we're using, yeah? So there's, that's very early on. We're now beginning to see the first person, the first people going to college with intellectual differences. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've had a few people um, finish college degrees in, in the US and some in, in Australia. There's some, some schemes that are working through some of the TAFEs, you know, the uh, higher education institutions there where you have access to certain kinds of, um, of higher education, often through the arts. It's actually really exciting to, to see how the art is at the forefront of that kind of higher education delivery. Anybody else is not in the room? Yeah. You talk about access there as well from sort of top down, mm -hmm. level, but also it's the notion of the people that surround you saying that this is not for you, no right. matter what, yeah. what, what's been passed over the years. Yeah. <coughs> and that bigotry is the stereotypicalness of that you should right. get over. Because you know, that's the story of my life where my family did not want Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So many people of us who come from a more working class background, it's not seen as a, as a value that can, su can support us. The same is true across racialized difference as well. You know, so that what is the use of certain kinds of education in certain kinds of environments is something that's coming up quite a lot. Or a different value system being embraced. So what is it that we have to do in order to open up value systems, things about value systems differently to ensure that more of us can be in a room together. So this is an interesting activity to run, and one that we try to begin every, every session with. You know, who are we and who are we not? You know, this is always an interesting question to ask. What, who is not pre present among us? How could we invite others into the room? This is, I think, one of the core questions for many of us who work in community arts, in disability arts. How do we not just reproduce who we are right now? How do we shift ourselves into a different future? a hard one. So in the current phase of our asylum project in 2016, we're focusing on spirituality. This is one of the ways in which we're trying to open the boat, think about how else we can think about disability and disability culture together. One focus for us has been through spirituality. We find that we can reach more people, open up who's in the room, if we think about spirituality together. Uh, one, this is not an aspect of disability and performance that is usually uh, as a focus in the literature, but one that has rich potential for the exploration of interdependence and infrastructural utopias. One of the touchstones for this project is Audre Lorde, who informs her politics with what she termed third world women consciousness. She writes, and I quote Audre Lorde, interdependency between women is the only way to the freedom which allows the I to be, not in order to be used, but in order to be creative. What are the conditions, support structures, and frames for our interdependency, for mutualities, convivialities, and supports that allow creative forms of thinking futures to emerge together? Let's explore these questions in performance engagement in two sites, Grand Rapids and Detroit, Michigan. Quite far away, but hopefully I'll take you along. So the current phase of the project began in October 2015 with Art Prize in Grand Rapids, which we, we saw each other last time, yeah. Um, here's a picture, there you go. Okay, I'm gonna audio describe the picture in a second. For the last three years, I've been involved with the disability arts programming of the event, um, so has Ruth. And this year, Stephanie, my partner, and I were invited to perform inside the $200,000, $200,000 is a lot of money, right? The grand jury winner. So when you win art prize, you get 200,000 bucks. 
um, which is like one of the largest art prizes anywhere ever. And it's a very, very weird and strange experiment because anybody can put their stuff up and the public votes. And sometimes the public winner and the jury prize winner are just like really different from one another. <laughs> oh my God. And sometimes they're the same. One year it was the same, it was gorgeous. It was this beautiful Alhambra-like light installation. This one this year was the grand jury winner by, by the jury, not by the, the, uh, the public. Um, the installation is called Higher Ground, and it's part of Site Lab, a site-specific art experiment that occurs each year at Art Prize and that regularly wins the Site Award for their beautiful installations, which usually remediate and repurpose abandoned urban structures. So I'm going to des describe the image in a second. Higher Ground repurposed an old abandoned convent which used to house a number of Dutch Catholic nuns. The artist Kate Gilmore painted the house pink on the outside and red on the inside and installed swings in the rooms. Volunteer women donned white dresses and red shoes in a dressing room in the back of the house and then they swing in the rooms to the window ledge and beyond without engaging the audience who watch from the street. So that's what we're seeing in the picture. Let's just uh, gather a few audio descriptions. So if just one or two of you could just shout out, what are you seeing? What, what comes to your mind when you see this, Joy. this picture? Joy. Joy, thank you. So it's two women swinging out of the windows. We see, we see this pink house, two swings with women on them going outwards. You see Joy. What else are we seeing? Yeah. The windows are really black and then the, the white body and feet kick right. out of it. Yeah, yeah, it's a rapture, you know, it's a real disruption and colour abundance going on. Thank you. What else? More audio description. Uh, it's not really audio description, but because they're in white escaping from a dark space, I would say escape. Escape, thank you. Anybody else? One it's a very unusual house in a very mundane background. There's concrete that's grey and some trees in the back. But this house, I don't think you would ever see it in a mundane background normally. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't normally be painted pink, I guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's not bricks. When you say convent, I think they're bricks. And it's like strips of wood, I suppose. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Horizontal yeah. wood, so it's layers of that that's been painted. Yes, great. Yes, yeah, the cladding. It's a clad house. Yeah, great. Excellent, thank you. So on the day after the jury prize announcement was made, so they had just said, this is the thing, about the thousand art installations that are going on in the town, this is the one that gets 200,000 buckaroonies. <laughs> so everybody was coming to the house and was making photographs. So that day, Stephanie and I were invited onto the swings, part of our day surveying art prize installations before delivering a public critique session in the evening discussing selected works from a disability culture perspective. So that's what we do every year. So it's this very sweet integration of disability arts and the regular festival. Chris Smith, who's the organizer of Dis Arts, and you're working with as well, he invites us out and we, we deliver a public crit. We go around, check out all the stuff, and then we talk about a few examples, often with the artist in the room, and give a critique, you know, like a supportive critique, from a disability culture perspective. It's a really sweet way of working. Uh, this in entry into the inside of the art, oh here's a picture. So here's a picture of Chris Smith, who is this very darling person who runs a large disability arts outfit in Grand Rapids. Um, he's sitting in uh, his, his power wheelchair. Behind that is me, the Scooty. So Scooty is my little uh, power scooter. I'm sitting on the Scooty and draped across me is my beautiful sweetheart, Stephanie, <laughs> uh, whom you're going to see some more of. And in the background, you, you see the pink house. So this is us having fun on a beautiful October day in Michigan. It's adorable. It's another important part, of course, conviviality. You know, hanging out with one another is a very significant component of all this work. So we were able to go into this house, and this entry into the inside of the art allowed us to engage in the kind of infrastructural analysis rarely possible in performance work. How is it done? What are the rules or score for a particular engagement? Who set up what and in which way? Exploring these questions allows me to engage in what performance studies scholar Shannon Jackson terms infrastructural, infrastructural avowal. 
the affirmation and amplification of public and structural supporting structures. What does it mean on the ground to make a whole street in Grand Rapids into a museum, an art exhibit, to shift and heighten the historical nature of the buildings and the people who live here? Who lives around here now? What support structures subtend their lives? How do they come here? What borders do they cross? Where are the buses? Where are the power lines? Where are the street lights? Those are important questions to ask in Michigan where we don't always have street lights. What are we doing here? We, as us three, tourists visiting with post-urban ruin porn. I put that in quotation marks with my fingers. Ruin porn is what we call many of people visiting Detroit and making lots of pictures with themselves in front of the abandoned houses. These are the kind of questions activated by Site Lab's exhibit. Stephanie and I swung in the old convent for 30 minutes, and in that time, lots of people came and photographed us. We had activated the exhibit, opening a form of energy conduit, a ghost machine. We created wind in the rooms. Our actions linked heaven and earth, air swishing past our ears, our thighs, and we had to struggle to keep our shoes on as they swung out of the window. Our thighs were hurting and our legs trembled. It takes quite a lot to swing for half an hour. Yeah, it's a long time. And this aspect of durational performance shifted our attention inside the red rooms. It was really easy to feel other presences, ghosts or memories, and to think about who looked out of those windows before, what they were seeing, and how they lived on the edge of public and private, as nuns, as contemplative women in a complex world. Stephanie and I had just visited with the Emily Dickinson Museum in Amherst the weekend before, and her white dress was on display there. Women and sanctuary, clothes and windows, poetry and performance slipped into one another. In keeping with arts-based methods, these questions not only informed intellectual engagement, they became pressing questions as we pressed our bodies into service. Throughout this day and the next one, we met with women who remembered the nuns' lives in the street, and other women who also swung on the swings and shared their own body histories and the stories and the memories and fantasies that visited them during their half-hour experience of trembling thighs. <laughs> In her response to, to the experience of swinging, here's another picture. This is Stephanie swinging. So this is a picture of the red inside of the room with the very bright pink outside because I had to heighten it in order to get the picture because as someone just mentioned, it's very, it's very dark inside, very bright outside, so it's hard to photograph. So we see Stephanie in her white dress with her red shoes reaching out of the window. In her response to the experience of swinging, Stephanie used poetry, a medium well suited to capture multiple folds of sensation, imagery, and engagement. She begins with the performance instructions offered to us in the dressing room and unfolds them then in multiple ways. So we use poetry as a trace in academic writing. So I now have the poem on the PowerPoint slides and I would love you to just take a line of the poem into your own mouth. So if you can read this, read a line and let someone else read the next line. Okay, so let's just make a chorus out of this. Oh, so I forgot about that picture. There's another picture that I just put into the wrong place, it seems. This is the last picture um, from the installation. It's a picture, it's all red. We're inside the room and we're looking behind the, the, uh, the body of the person swinging out towards the window. And the exciting thing about the picture is that it's a, it's a woman in a wheelchair swinging. So the, the swing is hooked up to the, the arms of a wheelchair. So it's kind of a, it's, fu it's funny, it's kind of lovely. You know, I don't know how the hell she swung with her wheelchair. I would never want to put my wheelchair in that situation, but hey, you know, it looks great. It's just so fun. This is very unexpected. So the, the wheelchair literally lifts off, is off the ground, and she's gently swinging that wheelchair backwards and forth. It's a manual wheelchair, and she's holding onto those, those lines. And she's wearing the white dress, too, so you can see the crisscrossing um, straps of the dress. So I think it's extremely lovely and, and great. And it's, it's for Chris. Chris Smith is the person who made this happen, the guy that I showed earlier who's, the, who's running that festival. He keeps at all the exhibitors in Grand Rapids at Art Price to, to integrate, to bring disability stuff into the art experience. So him pushing, pushing, pushing in his very adorable way meant that this happened. You know, that someone who's using a chair can get hooked up to the swings. It's not really the hardest thing in the world to do, right? So let's just do it. If this woman wants to do that, let's go for it. 
So all these women all over Grand Rapids swimming, swinging in the, uh, in the convent. That's the Pope, higher ground, who's going to take the first life. Do not take photographs of the inside. Do not share the architectural details. <clears throat> Nor how the doors open and close on their own. Do find a dress that fits. Shrug your upper body into cut nude stockings to match your skin tone. The red shoes should reach just past the windowsill. Do not break the character. Do not engage or respond to onlookers. You are home inside the red house with pink outsides. You are home inside this organ that needs your swinging. We can all read this, the refrain together. Refrain. Swing, 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 swing. Hold on to the swing ropes. Center your butt on the plank swing seat. Use your inner thighs to stay the course. Do not mention the punishment for stopping. <laughs> the elastic to bind the shoes. The generous padding to protect hands from rope wear. Become a metronome. Make eternity tick. You are protected. The dress stays white. Remember this is voluntary. Notice the entry locks from the inside. It is your decision to swing. To, uh, to wear white and become see-through. The signature may do a ghost. The onlookers take photographs and video with smartphones. Blurred images with unrecognizable faces. They don't know the house doesn't stop breathing. The rhythm enters. Swing, 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 swing. The house becomes your body. The walls show your insides. Let your hands unclasp the rope. Slip your butt off the seat. Try and fail. The swings become mandatory. You can't unborn to your there's no exit, only entry. Notice the wall red paint on the window. Sir. There have been others before you. You feel their breath on your neck. Hands that give you a push when your tempo lags. There will be others after you. For now, serve your sentence. Swing, 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 swing. swing. Swing, 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 swing. Begin with I am. The house will fill in the rest. The house will take care of you. See the stability of load bearing walls. How windows aren't needed. Thank you. In her writing, Stephanie captures the quality of repetition that characterizes the performance. And it's really nice to hear you all real swing, 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 swing. I can't wait to tell her. She also meditates on the experience of cloister life, an experience that presses on us as we spend open time in empty rooms touched by long gone lives. Her poem opens the convent experience and our durational performance into her own memory of the mental asylum with all its complexities of safety and stricture, separation and violence, the pressure of isolation, and the need for that pressure of isolation. The house in its site lab row of art-purposed abandoned homes in neglected urban space speaks complexly to issues of stability and support. And thank you for leaning your support to the poem, your support to our experience. It's really interesting to see this taken on in other people's mouths and tongues. I'm moving on to the next performance, Lighthouse. 
I'll describe that in a second. Lightbox Detroit. In February 2016, so just a few months ago, we engaged in one of the many asylum workshops we are continuing to lead across the US and beyond. In this particular one, we are once again in a religious site, now with a focus on black women's spirituality. Lightbox is a new artist-run space in Detroit, located just two blocks from the center of the famous Detroit unrests of 1967. These, de these unrests are often called riots, a word that already characterizes a particular attitude or center to the events. So I keep calling it the unrest. The unrest origins focused on its own sanctuary space, a blind pig. It's interesting how disability language comes back into this. A blind pig is an unlicensed drinking establishment. And that this blind pig happened in the office of the United Community League for Civic Action. The night of the unrests, a party of 82 black people celebrated the return of two local GIs from the Vietnam War. Detroit police tried to arrest the revelers and a thrown bottle hitting a policeman became the origin of five destructive days of civil unrest. I'm sure you're all hearing in the after swing swing here what is going on right now and what could happen in the US in particular at any moment. This story holds many swinging memories, in particular as I write these lines in June 2016. So when I initially wrote this in June, last month, just last month, it was days after the terrible and deadly destruction of queer Latinx sanctuary of the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. Who is safe in what spaces? Lightbox is a place in a complex relationship to history, sites, and Detroit changes. It's now an artist-run space in the process of being renovated by Stephanie Cohen and Corey Gerhardt to a Michigan-based performance artist. Before this iteration of its public function, the building was a bank, at that point in a Jewish-dominated neighborhood. In, in line with racialized histories of Detroit space making, the building was eventually sold into African-American ownership and transformed into a Baptist church. So this was a bank that then became a Baptist church. And just repeating that, because it's kind of cool, right? I mean, <laughs> wow. At the point of our performance in Lightbox, the building held both an old bank vault, so downstairs in the cellar there's a bank vault with a thick metal door, and a baptismal font, ready for full immersion, both in the basement. Cool, right? That's really cool. Our performance took place on a loaned dance floor. Lightbox is in transformation, like so many spaces in Detroit, and is trying to reclaim the building from the encroaching brownfield wildernesses around it. Many houses on the surrounding blocks are burned out and abandoned, and reassuring visitors to the performance space of its parking safety is part of the emails the space owners send out as part of image maintenance in border zones. You, know, you need to tell people it's safe to leave your car there or else they're not gonna come to your space. It's that kind of place. <clears throat> and indeed, many of the 20 or so workshop participants who came out to our Olympia's workshop in Lightbox from the, sub well, from the suburbs, or like me, from Ann Arbor, a city that is a 45 minute ride and many income brackets away. The Detroit locals who came and joined us were relatively recent Detroit transplants, some from Brooklyn, and I, you know, you probably read some stuff about Detroit, about Detroit, right? Like people who can't afford to rent in Brooklyn, they come to Detroit because you can afford to rent in Detroit. Uh, and some are from other art cities further away. Many young artists are attracted by Detroit's rising art star, by its cheap rents, and the realness of its urban vibe. So here's a picture of, um, it says at the bottom, this is, this is a closed caption video, and it, the, the screen capture that I have captured part of the closed captioning, it says, so all of us work together, which is a very nice way of describing Olympia's practice. And we see a picture of um, a bunch of people, um, mainly white, um, or at least white, white, um, uh, visibly white. Doesn't mean that they're necessarily, whatever their heritage might be, right? So that's kind of, I'll get there in a minute. <laughs> um, and they're lying, it's kind of hard to see in this particular light, but that this is actually a choir. This is a choir store. Um, and there's some fake um, clouds in the back. They're sort of cardboard cutout clouds with um, sort of shiny paper around them. They're there from the original Baptist church. It's kind of fun, there's all this stuff still turning around. So the choir stalls mean this is a, this is a, raked, a raked place, you know, where, where choirs would, would, would stand on and sing. You kind of know what I'm talking about. 
tell me that you know what I'm talking about. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so, so that's the kind of environment that we're seeing here. So some of us are down at the bottom looking up, some are up looking down, and people just sprawling on this, this choir, choir stall. Uh, they've kind of just been doing stuff, and I'll tell you in a minute what we have been doing, but I just wanted to use a picture to give you a sense of the space and its interestingness. Lightbox sits right at the border of art, hip, and blight. Its distance to lunch eateries, a measurement of sprawling Detroit struggle to maintain the kind of infrastructure that can keep a city alive. So the workshop had to provide some of its own infrastructure, and we shaped our community engagement around a communal meal. Many participants came to our free workshop bringing beautiful food gifts, either homemade or purchased in the rich food districts of Detroit. After our space art making, we engaged these different art practices of delicious cooking and loving presentation as we fed each other with tamales and halva, hummus, guacamole, and cake. I mention all this because it's an important part of a disability culture workshop, feeding ourselves, engaging all our different art forms. We know where people came from as these stories of immigration and settlement became part of our workshop, and everybody spoke their story of arrival to the walls that surrounded us for all of us to hear. In our workshop, we explored meanings of asylum and of sacred space. From the space owners, we heard stories of the woman who served as prophetess to the Baptist community. Once we heard about her, she became a strong presence among us as she became a raft, a cross-cultural presence that could carry the weight of black agency. There were a few people of color among us and lots of people who signaled as white in the space come with family memories of persecution and racism. Everybody in the room shared stories of immigration and historical struggle. It is a US space. But many of us also spoke out about the experiential difference between the white dominated insight of many newer Detroit art spaces like this one and who seems to be sitting outside, black people on stoops, ambling on the sidewalks, the complex race, class, and disability politics of space. We voiced our awareness, discomfort, and sense of helplessness in the face of these ongoing and deep racial divisions. This unnamed black woman prayer leader came to fantastical life in our shared altered reality <coughs> as we lay under the giant folded hands in prayer pose that still hover over the old choir store. You can't see it in the picture, that's kind of above there. That's literally, you know, like folded hands like that. It's kind of interesting. Um, in our workshop, we began with an introduction round. What brought you here? The fact that we had opened with the building's history meant that soon the circled stories reached to immigration and family stories. We thought in the round about asylum, sanctuary, arriving into safety and what that means. Then we contacted the walls, the bricks, the skin of the building that housed us. We walked and wheeled in the space, focusing our gazes on architectural details, loosening our gaze to see each other milling. We felt our own skin, explored it in contact with the skin of others, of the building's fabric, molding ourselves into niches and finding new perspectives. Our actions incorporated familiar space warm-up exercises from performance techniques like viewpoints or body-mind centering. That's for those of you who do performance stuff. Asylum within and without, where do you locate safety inside your body? What is your sensory what is your sanctuary sensation? We also wrote together, finding ways of holding safe some of the sensations and insights that had bubbled up when we had spent long minutes drifting along walls, touching woodwork, climbing in the choir, and curling up on giant heating duct structures. It was nice and warm on a cold February De Detroit day. In a final group installation, we created a social somatic a breathing, living sculpture in space in the heritage of my own home and one of its people, artist Joseph Boys. Those of us who could move well started us out high up in the choir store. And I just went to a picture that shows this. So we now get a bit better picture of the choir stalls and the, the chairs on it. And we see a number of people that sort of, some are sitting high up. And we're sort of at mid-level right now. We have a bunch of people in touch with one another, touching one another around chests and faces. And we see like a river of bodies and faces moving down this choir store. 
So those of us who could move well started out high up in the choir stall, the racked tiers of carpeted wood that reach up to the back wall of the space. Depending on our, on our mobility and agility, we added ourselves in various ways to an emerging river of bodies that flowed down the choir into the wider open space. People laid themselves on top of others, feeling their breath, and touched other people's wrists and necks, finding pulses running through. Once we were all in place, a stilled waterfall of humanity pouring down from the praying hands, we sang. We sang to the building whose fabric and history we had so thoroughly explored. We made use of some of the lines we had written after our movement explorations and put melodies to them, some quiet, some louder, echoing in the room. Sound waves held memories of gospel, rhythm and blues, of udulation, of humming. After our house concert, we shared what had happened, what we had felt lying there, connected, singing, witnessing. People spoke of seeing children play in the choir stalls while a service went on. Some saw the prophetess sitting on a chair in the middle of the room, gently swaying. Some saw their ancestors at Ellis Island. Some saw the windows being bricked up during the unrest. This was an invited haunting, reaching out with all our senses to gain new purchase on what surrounds us, supports us, enables the particular shape of the lives we lead, aware of histories and costs, of who is in the room and who is not. Sociologist Avery Gordon defines haunting as an animated state in which a repressed or unresolved social violence is making itself known, sometimes very directly, sometimes more obliquely. These very real Detroit ghosts rose among us. So much for closing this particular picture. I'm just going to end on the, the, last, the last image of this is this one, just because I like it so much and I thought I'd share that with you because it gives a sense of the, um, the feeling of the space. So um, Detroit Public Television, which is our PBS, our BBC equivalent, they came and they did a documentary on the Olympias, my art collective, during this particular workshop. This is why I have all these lovely pictures because none of us go around and make pictures while we're all like trancing out and meditating. So normally I don't have anything, but the, now I have all these videos still, so it's really cool. <laughs> So, so if you want to see the, this documentary, it's like eight minutes long, it's really nice. Uh, it gives a nice sense of disability arts. So then here's a picture of um, I and I and Stephanie. Just a nice way of showing you Stephanie once more as well. Um, we both wear red. I have my red glasses on rather than the blue glasses I'm wearing right now. Uh, so it all looks very peaceful. This is us doing this river of humanity as we're flowing down from the choir stall. Uh, we both have our eyes closed. I'm just lying there, it's quite beautiful, nice to look at. <laughs> so in each of these sites, we engaged or developed physical scores to enact as a way of attracting stories and local connection, both in Grand Rapids and in Detroit. We ask, what does asylum mean to you? What is sanctuary? What is, what is safe space for spirituality, for disabled people, for queer people, for women, for people of color? Through these actions, we point to who is with us on the street, in sight, and who is not. We explore the mechanisms and infrastructures of support that allows us a moment of tenuous community, enacting interdependency. Food delivery systems, street lights, emergency vehicle routes, bus services, sewer lines, even the accessibility of compost toilets. Which parts of the city and the rural are deemed worthy of what services, which body minds are condemned to doing without? We also explore the human networks that we are part of, the efficacy of disability culture listservs, the grapevine of Facebook, twittering and tweeting, working out how we get the news out, find each other, share what we did, bear witness to each other and our joint labor, encouraging you to take the lines of the poem into your own mouth. Again and again, we are pointing to the creativity of our communities, the resources we find as we move together collectively desiring each other and the creative labor that does not hierarchically value one form over another. At some point in most of these encounters, we end up layering people on top of one another with their permission, touching breath to breath and pulse to pulse. We touch what we lie on, the fabrics of buildings and their histories, 
and we act like antennae, reaching into a house's pulses, their material vibrations. As I'm writing this, Stephanie and I are preparing to engage in a three-week asylum project residency in Norway, in Oslo, where these questions will likely resonate very differently in the midst of the Syrian crisis, asylum seekers challenging the cooperative fantasy of Europe. To end, and to point to our utopian horizon, our queer forward-dawning futurity, to cite Jose Esteban Munoz. Our long-term project longs to offer a performance response to the methodological challenges emerging from mad studies, disability culture, somatic writing practice, women of color feminism, and queer feminist embodied art heritages. How can we witness and amplify histories of intersected violence and emergent forms of healing? We sing out, listening to echoes, where is asylum? A little coda. Just after writing the first draft of this essay, right, Stephanie and I were invited back to Lightbox for the wedding of the two founders. That was nice, right? It's nice, good. A queer ritualist joined them together, witnessed by a big party of people of all ages, races, native and immigrant status. The Orlando tragedy had just happened. It was literally like two weeks ago. And, was in most, and, and the, Orlando the Orlando tragedy was in most of the conversations I had with many wedding guests who, also, who were also working in the arts, social justice, and therapy fields. Many guests skipped over from the Allied Media Conference events just down the road from Lightbox. And the Allied Media Conference, have you guys heard of that? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Allied Media Conference? It's like one of our big social justice events in the US. Like lots of people come together, like thousands and they investigate you know, social justice, race justice issues. It's always in Detroit. My favorite chat of the day was with Sun. Sun, whose real name is uh, Rishon, a second generation Detroit inhabitant and a fierce defender of the city. She engages in spirit writing, a form of automatic writing. She knows other prophetesses, Baptist pastors, but engages a different facet of the work. Sun channels experiences and then puts them in third-person stories on Facebook to see who resonates with what comes through. Members of her circle will then write back and together they will parse meanings and blessings. In exchange for her story of her channeling practice, I shared with her our recent performance in the space, listening and singing to Lightbox to the walls and bricks, witnessing their histories and habitations. We compared our different cultural approaches to channeling to ghosts, honoring the differences and the similarities in our performances, we were cross-cultural ritualists together, one quoting Yob, one using performance heritages. We celebrated being woven into many different energy streams, channeling toward new and more just worlds in our different modalities. This ends my coda. What are the histories and futures of disability culture work? How can we stay attentive to who is and is not in the room with us? Who are our allies in intersected, community-engaged research creation? We sing out, listening to echoes. Where is asylum? Thank you. Five minutes uh, for, for questions. Oh, I just went on and on, did I? <laughs> Not at all. Oh, good. <laughs> the problem with jet, jet lag. Well, was, you were a lovely audience. Thank you so much. And thank you for really engaging with the poem and the audio description and the, the interpretation, audio description leaning into interpretation. It's very, it's really lovely and a nice interdependent way of talking to you guys. Do you have any questions? During a meal, I can also jump from one table to the next and just chat with everybody a bit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, Beatrice. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, I just wondered, and forgive me if I didn't pick it up at the end, um, did you discuss uh, the idea of the haunting that you experience in your artwork um, and the, the spiritual, the, the lady who does the spiritualism yeah. and the automatic writing. You discussed this experience with her? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, so you did. Um, and was, was she open to the, to your secular, yeah. secularization of that experience? Yeah. Yes, she was. Yeah, I mean, we, we just, 
it was really quite a lovely. It just happened, right? So not really kind of done lots of work with it or not visited Sun and her practices. But we just sat there and talked about these different things that we're doing in the space. And we just like, look, my boy, that, that's quite similar. You know, it's really quite similar. She was very, very much coming from a religious framework. Um, but she could totally see the connection. We were there at a wedding, you know, so we were there at sort of semi secular dash religious dash all kinds of things. So, so it, it opened us up to really think about this in a really interesting way. But, um, but yeah, and I'm I'm very careful that, I mean, up until just a few years ago, I would have definitely always said secular. You know, the work is secular. I am I don't think that would help me now. You know, I don't really do that anymore because, um, no, to some people in our disability culture work, it's not secular. And I just need to be mindful that my own framework, I am not religious, um, but I am spiritual. And I, that's, for me, a, a connection to many people in the community. It's not helpful to, for me to import a certain kind of academic secularism into community performance work if I want to reach out to the people I want to work with, then I then religious differences and religious experiences become part of it, and they, they have been and they be and it's been really enriching and interesting. You know, so we we have religious um, perspectives in the room. We always then need to balance that with other kinds of acceptances. I mean, Stephanie and I are a queer couple, right? So um, there are all kinds of things that need to be balanced against one another, but. Working that out is for me one of the exciting parts of this kind of work, right? We work out in a nutshell what mutual respect and including respect for spiritual heritage would mean. Yes, thank you very much. I found, I found that particularly uh, engaging uh, yeah. aspect, and I think it's very interesting when you're uh, engaging in artwork and the emotive, and that lends itself to the spiritual but not necessarily religious. That's right. So it's about those differences. Thank yeah, sometimes we need to lean into the religious as well, because that's the way in for us to be with one another. Thank you. Okay, thanks folks. Listen, I think we best stop there.